Welcome to the Manhattan Institute's event on the case for Miami. I'm Michael Hendricks, Director of State and Local Policy here at MI. For what seems like more than a generation, Silicon Valley has seemed to be the headquarters of the tech revolution. New fortunes and new industries just seem to be created overnight there. But recently, something seems to have changed. Um, many Americans seem to be wondering whether uh, our country's tech leaders and even themselves uh, might be in search of greener pastures, uh, sandy beaches, and maybe a friendlier government. And uh, to discuss all of that and the case for Miami, we're thrilled to be joined by two excellent people for that subject, Keith Raboy and Mayor Francis Suarez. Now, throughout our discussion, please enter your questions in whatever platform you're watching us, and I'll wrap it in. Uh, so first up, I'm proud to introduce Mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez. Prior to be elected with 86% support from Miami's residents, Mayor Suarez has served, served as the commissioner for District 4 for eight years. Mayor Suarez has been an unapologetic champion for Miami and booster for the city. Uh, unafraid to take to Twitter to ask dissatisfied Silicon Valley dwellers what it would take to get them and their businesses to relocate to Miami, which is why we're also thrilled to be joined by Keith Raboy. Mr. Raboy is a tech investor and general partner at Founders Fund and a former executive at PayPal, Square, and LinkedIn. He has a track record of being ahead of the curve on emerging issues, and that's why he's also placed his bet on Miami. Mayor Suarez, I wanna start with you. Why Miami? Why are we hearing about people and businesses moving, moving. to Miami? Well, I think it's a confluence of reasons. Some of them are macro factors that are out of our control. And I think there are some factors that are within our control. The macro factors that are outside of our control began with the salt deduction. When uh, high tax states and cities uh, could not deduct their uh, state and local income taxes from uh, their federal income taxes, uh, they, they the differential in cost of living between a place like Miami and a place like, for example, San Francisco or New York, was exacerbated by an additional 10 and a half percent to 13 uh, percent. That's that was one thing. I think the second thing is you saw, for whatever reason, city leaders pushing away innovators uh, from their city. Uh, you saw the classic case of a, of a, of a councilwoman in uh, in San Francisco that said F Elon Musk. Uh, you had another a case where you had multiple elected officials uh, pushing away Amazon from New York. Uh, and then I think the third thing is you know they don't these cities don't seem to take care of the quality of life of their residents they don't they you know i could hear constant complaints about uh, increasing crime and increasing homelessness in a lot of these major cities and so we're seeing that these policies that they're uh, enacting are driving innovative uh, people away from their cities and unfortunately for me as a cuban american we saw this sort of happen in cuba uh, where uh, a charismatic leader came in and said, hey, we can solve all of society's problems. All we have to do is just tell the government uh, to take everyone's private property, everyone's uh, businesses, and we'll just make sure that everyone's equal. And the only thing that that system of government has, uh, has guaranteed for all citizens is equal misery. So our, our formula is simple. We uh, keep taxes low. Uh, we don't have a state income or local income tax, and we've reduced taxes under my watch the second lowest rate uh, since the 1960s. Uh, we, we, while many cities defunded their police, we actually increased our police funding. We have the most police officers uh, that we've ever had in our history. We reduced crime by 25% last year and had the lowest homicide rate since 1954, the year before. And then we invest in our quality of life. We realize that people like Keith Rebois, they can't live yesterday again. So they're going to they're gonna increasingly decide to live in cities that have the best quality of life, the best weather, uh, the best cultural offerings, the best sports offerings, the best restaurants, the best entertainment venues. And we're investing in that uh, tremendously. Uh, and then I would say at the end, you know, we have an attitude and I have an attitude of how can government facilitate your success? Government should not be an obstructor. Government cannot solve all of society's uh, issues. Uh, that is solved through a combination of innovation, frankly, um, uh, you know, amazing people like Keith who are uh, very generous and, and, and uh, are philanthropic, you know, philanthropic um, and who continue to build company and build wealth for cities. I mean, we have to we have to be thankful. And I'm personally very grateful for the relationship that I have with Keith and for having Keith as a Miami champion. We wouldn't be where we are right now at this moment without Keith. There is no doubt about it. And it's because of people like him that put their money where their mouth is. Uh, who, who want to do something new, who, who take risks, 
and who um, and who build companies and build wealth for not just himself but for many other people. Those are the kind of people that we want in our city. Those are the kind of people that we should want in our country. Well, uh, that's a great case for Miami. We can just end the program right there. <laughs> that's amazing. But okay. But uh, I, seriously, though, I, I also want to ask too. So these are these are long running trends. You're talking about some big structural factors too. Um, is there anything about this moment in particular during the pandemic that you feel has also contributed to people taking a look at Miami? There's no doubt about it. Um, I think the fact that uh, we have uh, remote work, uh, the fact that Miami has been relatively open while other cities have been relatively closed, I think that uh, with the how can I help tweet and, and with people like Keith uh, really making a big public bet on Miami has all conspired to make this moment possible. I truly believe that uh, Miami will, in the next five to 10 years, be the most important city in the globe, not just in the country, but in the world. We're going to be the capital of capital, uh, both intellectual capital and monetary capital. And it's going to come from everywhere. I mean, it's already coming from uh, Israel, from New York, the Con Valley. And what's great is they all have Well, Keith, I want to turn to you. Um, and by the way, we'll also get back to the mayor's uh, tweet from a couple months ago. But but Keith, uh, you moved to Miami. Why did you move? And was there a moment when you made the decision? I don't know if there's a moment versus uh, spending six months, you know, sort of researching various options to escape California. I think, you know, California generally and certainly the Bay Area specifically, are completely dysfunctional from a political level, from a societal level, and you know, from actually not even understanding the, the intention of politics. Um, they sort of inverted the process of the government representing people instead of we're supposed to represent the government and politicians. And so we were looking around for options that would allow us to be professionally successful, personally happy, and you know, live in an aspiration, raise kids in an aspirational culture. And in the United States, the answer is very obvious that Miami is by far the best choice. There, you know, you can debate various places outside the U.S., but that's a very complex topic and very complicated professionally as well and personally. So I think Miami was by far, on any metric, the best choice from a taxation, regulation, entrepreneurial culture, um, from a work work ethic, hunger, aspirational escape, you know, immigrant culture, the cosmopolitan mix of people from Latin America, Europe, New York, if you include that as diverse, um, you know, from a societal perspective of retail, art, athletics, the mix was just unprecedented cuisine. So it felt like a no brainer choice, actually. So, so just to dig into that a little bit more, knowing that for you, it's such a no brainer, uh, why, why this moment? Why now? Uh, some of those factors have existed for quite some time in Miami, but you, you, you made the decision now. Um, and why should others make the decision now? So I'd separate two things. First of all, the dysfunction of California in the Bay Area was just increasing from homelessness to security, property, crime, even violent crime from the educational system, from the artificial lockdowns and, you know, re uh, absurd and anti-data science uh, COVID policies in the Bay Area in California. That was all, you know, a trigger that accelerated the thinking about in, in the diagnosis that California is going to get worse before it gets better. Then secondly, COVID lowered the cost of experimentation. So people with a remote first culture, because we had to be remote first, uh, enabled me, enabled my colleagues, aspirational colleagues, to try other parts of the United States at you know basically no opportunity cost where we didn't have to quit our jobs to consider new options. And as people consider new options, friends, family, colleagues, the feedback was, oh my God, why are we suffering through this Bay Area mess? Do we really have to? And we started asking questions, well, do we really have to? Well, why? Are, 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 are the handcuffs more psychological or are they actually pretty real? Like, is there a network effect that would preclude success as an entrepreneur, as a technologist, as a venture capitalist, 
or are those kind of mental fictions? And as you double clicked on all these issues, you really came to the conclusion that it was actually sort of the fake news. It was a proverbial fake news that the Bay Area had like a monopoly on talent, that it had a monopoly on ideas, or that it had a monopoly on a network of talented individuals. That's in, in th that is like that kind of a wake up moment. I, I, I think we're gonna get back to that in, in teasing out some of the factors you mentioned. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to get back to you too um, to, to build on that. I feel like you've you've lived so much of the past year. Um, you caught COVID early on in the pandemic and captured the whole experience in daily video updates. Um, when people in firms were packing up moving trucks, you tweeted out, how can I help? And went viral. And now you're very online. You're on the move as people can see. Uh, and, and also there's the sense that the city is open and booming. So, so that's a, that's a lot. So what has it been like as mayor since that December 4th tweet? And do you do your own tweets? It's been organized chaos is what it's been. Uh, and yes, actually what's interesting is that prior to the December 4th tweet, this is true. Prior to December 4th tweet, um, I did not do most of my tweeting. I would say I did maybe 10, 15% of my tweeting. Post December 4th, I would say I do, I mean, in December, I probably did about 80 to 90% of my tweets. I actually tweeted over 800 times, which got 27 million impressions, uh, you know, which is crazy. I mean, it's all organic. There was no, no, no paid. Uh, but, but I remember a moment, and I, I, I don't know if Keith remembers this, but I remember a moment we were in a chat, a group chat, and I asked Keith, I said, you know, is it too much? You know, I, I, I had a sense, you know, as a politician, you always have this sense of like, you know, am I, am I, am I too in people's faces? Is it too much? And Keith goes, don't stop. You know, that was what he told me. Don't stop. And I did. Is, you know, is, I that, is that what advice. you remember, Keith? Yeah, well, in fact, there's several other very successful technology people on this thread. And the uniform feedback from extremely successful founder CEOs was, actually keep going because it's really tapping in and resonating and people really respect both the effort and they are looking for future solutions and so we all encouraged him to continue and, and also i, I imagine it's advice. telling it's good advice and i imagine it's telling that you weren't just tweeting but you're also on these group chats like that that also suggests something i i, I guess i don't normally encounter mayors on group chats Look, it, like it, the one it's, you're it's describing. Yeah, it's interesting how it all sort of came together. It, it, it became sort of an informal advisory group, you know, for me. You know, so there were so many different questions. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a neophyte, really, when it comes to tech, even though I feel like I have a PhD now in tech, uh, given everything that has happened in the last three months. But pre-December 4th, the way I describe it is that the 10 years that I was trying to create a technology ecosystem in Miami was uh, akin to nine months inside a womb. And the December 4th tweet was like me being born. And so having advisors like Keith and others that I could, you know, when I wanted to push forward on something, when someone suggested it, I had a group of really, really smart people that could tell me, wait a second, on this thing, you got to hit the brakes. Uh, on this thing, you should hit the gas. I mean, and, and, and that's why this has been successful. People think a lot of this is genius on my part. And actually what it is, I've just surrounded myself by, with geniuses. And the geniuses that I've surrounded myself with are the ones that are giving me good advice on on, on how not to not to step on a landmine, actually. So, I mean, speaking of of advice, uh, how have you been incorporating advice and in how you've approached the pandemic? It seems like sometimes if you're in New York or San Francisco, it's it's not so much a conversation on you know tech growth and opportunity in florida that people are talking about it's COVID in florida it's the pandemic it should you open should you not open it all these questions how did you approach uh tackling this pandemic safely reopening miami's economy and incorporating uh good wise counsel as you did that you know i did it i think in the same way that i approached the pandemic to this sort of a tech renaissance in the city which is surrounding myself with the best people and it, when you surround yourself with the best people, you get the best advice. And you have to be humble enough to understand you don't know everything, and and humble enough to understand that um, you know you know Keith and, and others are subject matter experts, just like I dealt with subject matter experts on on coronavirus and on the economy. And and then you have to also follow your instincts. I mean, listen, Keith is brilliant, but he also has great instincts. 
right? So, he, you know, part of it is not just his brilliance, his intellectual brilliance, but part of it is feeling a decision. You know what I mean? And you have to, you, you know, our mind, I remember reading, I think, a Malcolm Gladwell book called Blink. You know, our mind is processing so many different things that we're more, much more finely tuned uh, to make decisions than we sometimes give ourselves credit for. Uh, but you do need to get input from experts. And I did that and then try to make the best decision possible. Keith, I mean, I, I, I know you're, you're not a public health expert, um, but, but certainly you've seen how this whole pandemic has gone down in California versus Florida. Are there other observations you made about how leaders approached it in one place versus the other? And, and what lessons learned you took away from that? Well, I mean, the contrast is incredibly sharp. I mean, we were out here house shopping in late October and you know, it was just night and day difference. We'd been locked down in California and you know, weren't allowed to do anything um, and nor were the schools open, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then we came here house shopping and the city was vibrant. As far as I could tell, no retail had been shut down. There were capacity constraints in the curfew and, you know, reasonable measures designed to limit the spread. And most people were eating outdoors, et cetera. But it, it was like night and day, both psychologically. I mean, I think that was the first thing that I noticed was people here were happy and smiling instead of depressed. And I think when I'm trying to move, in fact, when I'm trying to convince friends and colleagues to move here, the first thing I do is just get them on a plane take them off the plane and go out and walk around and they just see people smiling. You can't fake it at scale. And they, they forgot what it's like to see people smiling and feeling safe and secure. The two things they notice right away are people smile and they see police and the police are friendly and responsive and the citizens enjoy the presence of the police versus defunded police, under invested in police where you see homelessness, direct crime, drug abuse, right in front of police officers and they won't do anything about it because they've been either counseled, advised or mismanaged to do that. Whereas here the police are you know, involved in the community, they're very visible, transparent. And so those two things are incredibly stark contrast to everybody who comes from California. And they say, I want more of this. Like, how do I stay here? How do I stay here first for a month and extend their stay? And then they wind up buying property. I have several friends right now, who are actually house shopping. They came here on vacation, then they extended their stay, then they extended their stay. And now they have realtors. It, I mean, it, it is amazing how much of a difference it, it makes when you actually just show up in a place. Or, or I imagine also when, it, when a mayor just reaches out and asks the sort of question on Twitter that a VC would ask, you know, how, how can I help, right? I mean, that, that it, we hear so much about talent regulation. We hear so much about amenities and variety and basic services. And it's not like those things don't matter. I mean, you mentioned a lot of those factors. But I also hear you, Keith, and, and you, Mr. Mayor, too, as well, kind of mentioning the, shall we say, like the more invisible things, culture, um, just the, the kind of spirit, the sense, the smiles in people's faces. I mean, I'm really struck by how much you, you mentioned that, Keith. Well, you're only going to live your life once, as far as I know. And so, you know, you have goals, aspirational goals for yourself, professionally, for your family, et cetera, and you want to achieve those. And you want to enjoy your experience of living your life. And I think... The, 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 the sort of the fiction that you had to divide those two things is really misleading to people because in fact, you can fuse them together and have a successful career. You look at it in sports, like almost all the winning sports teams in any league in the United States right now, either the number one or number two team are in Florida. It's not accidental, I don't think. I think the same thing's true in real estate, same thing's true in financial services, and it's definitely gonna be in, in technology. And so I think you, want to live a holistic life and you don't want to make these incredible trade-offs. I also think this is very, you know, rooted in centuries of American history, which is we were supposed to vote with our feet. That was the whole goal of, you know, having laboratory democracy and all, and all the stuff that you'd read about in high school and be taught, but that people had sort of forgot were real options. And so Europeans have, you know, sort of escaped various poor government for decades. You know, every single um, successful rock band from the 1960s that emanated out of the UK left because the taxation and regulation policies were just so atrocious. They all relocated somewhere else on the planet and they wrote a, the Beatles wrote a very, you know, really good song about a tax man that, you know, it's worth listening to the lyrics really carefully. Um, so Americans had sort of forgotten about this option, I think, and somewhat, you know, ideologically driven people would suppress the option, but COVID highlighted that this option's real and that maybe we should take advantage of it. And that's what's basically unlocked. So I think the mayor tapped into a wave a wave of resentment of politicians abusing their citizens and taking us for granted, 
a wave of mismanagement and then a wave of opportunity where people could actually, you know, create the life they really want. Mayor Suarez, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, it's absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's funny because I, I think something that Keith said earlier really resonated with me, which is we need the complicated things, uh, you know, the, the things that we make complicated are really quite simple. You know what I mean? And, and, and the formula is really simple. It's not complicated. Um, and I, I think, you know, I'm traumatized. My family's traumatized from what we experienced in Cuba. And so what's happening is we see it happening again. We see governments falling into the same trap. And, and it's a false promise. It's a false promise that if you just grow government, um, we can just take care of more things. Right. And what we see is always it's the inverse. The more you grow government, the more incapable it is of taking care of uh, some of the most basic things. And really, the more you empower innovation and you empower the private sector, um, you're going to help. You're going to have, um, I think, uh, combinations of, of macro forces that can help really solve some of the big issues. For example, we have in our city right now 555 homelessness, 555. I know exactly how many we have. Okay, 555. Five, five. That's it. We have 555 in the city of Miami. I'm putting out a plan, hopefully in the next couple of months, to get to what I call functional zero. I want to get to zero, right? That's the goal, is to get to functional zero. That's not going to happen with government alone. It's going to happen with a combination of the private sector, the philanthropic sector, experts on homelessness, our government, the police. I mean, it's going to be, it's, it's a collaborative, cooperative effort, right? But once you do that, like with any company, that any problem that you solve at any company level, the, the next thing I'm going to try to do is scale it, right? And, and I'm going to be the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, so I'm going to be the president of all the mayors nationally. So what do you think my objective is going to be nationally if, if come January we're able to get to functional zero to end urban homelessness in America, right? That's the goal. So, so and that's what every big company founder does when Keith started PayPal. You know what I mean? It started as a company and, and it's revolutionized the entire payment system in the world, right? I mean, it's, it started with an idea and it dominates now the world, right? And so, you know, but again, you have to let the innovators and the creators do what they do best. And oftentimes government is an impediment to that. And worse, worse than that, elected officials not only do not appreciate people like Keith and Peter and and, and Elon and so many others that are in their community, Lucy, the Lucy Goose of the world, you know what I mean? They push them, they literally push them away because they have this perverse idea, idea that they're the ones that cause the societal problems. And that, you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's totally inverted. It's totally inverse. If it wasn't for Keith, you know, doing all the things that he does, you know, he's creating jobs on so many different levels. All he's doing is positive things. And let me tell you, when I, when I, when I did the How Can I Help Tweet, part of what prompted me to tweet 800 more times and then, you know, three or 400 times a month after that and, and generate 20, 25, 30 million impressions after that is the positivity. What I love about, what I love about the innovative community, the tech community is that they're positive. And the reason why they're positive is they have to be, you can't get up in the morning trying to create a company and build a product and think about all the ways you're going to fail. Yes, failure is a part of life. Yes, you're not going to succeed at everything. Yes, that's all true. But you wake up with an indomitable uh, spirit of of of, of can do uh, and 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 will do, and you solve problems and you and and you look at life from a problem solutions perspective, which is another thing that very much appeals to me. So the fact that there was so much excitement, and then I I found that same excitement in the crypto community, which is why I jumped head in on crypto. You know, so I, I just I, 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 I try to find these trends of excitement and positivity and I go all in, in 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 the context of our brand, which is to make Miami the most innovative city on the planet. Let's put a pin on the homelessness and housing discussion, because that's a good one. We want to come back to that. But on the subject of um, positivity and influence, Keith, I, we've got two questions in the audience that I want to lump together because they're good ones. One. How many of your friends and colleagues have you convinced to move to Miami? And second is the New York Stock Exchange has made noises about relocating to Miami. Are these idle threats or do you, or do you take it seriously? And I think I'll also want to direct this to the mayor. But Keith, first to you, how many of you convinced and when you hear companies saying we're going to make a move, how do you look at that? I think it's something like we're running about eight of my 10 closest friends are either here or moving here. And then about a hundred plus people, you know, that would be concentric circles around that. 
Um, we're building a company in Miami um, from the ground up. So, you know, I co-founded Open Door and um, it's a successful, you know, venture traded publicly now in reinventing real estate. And we're starting a new company in Miami where everybody who works in the company is going to be in Miami. Um, and so many people are moving here specifically to work on this company. And so that, that alone has made things easier. We're going to build from the ground up and it's going to take a decade, um, which is nice because venture capitalists have about a decade time horizon on every fund. Uh, so I don't expect Miami to outperform Silicon Valley in the next two years. But over the next 10, I think we can do a really good job in building the foundation for the future, you know, the future of America from an innovation perspective. Mm. I mean, the homelessness and, point is that this is a great stark contrast. So mm. the other third thing that people notice when they visit from California is lack of homeless people. Because literally in San Francisco, I actually probably could see 55, somewhere between 55 to 500 a day homeless people. And when people come here, they, they notice they don't see very many. And they, in fact, I can actually count every single homeless person I've seen that lived here three months. I actually literally can count. It's four. That's incredible. And, and, and Mr. Mayor, are, are these uh, idle or serious conversations about New York City's financial infrastructure moving to Miami? Oh, yeah, they're very serious. And I would say I actually spoke to the the parent company of the New York Stock Exchange. You know, the New York Stock Exchange is... Um, it's a little bit more complex because it's not what it used to be. People uh, think of the New York Stock Exchange as a, as a place where people used to trade. It was a physical place. New York Stock Exchange has become uh, essentially a virtual place at this point. And, and so really what it is is a brand. And so it would kind of be kind of weird to, to change the brand from New York to Miami. Uh, so those are the conversations that we've had, but but if they put a wealth uh, tax, which is what they're thinking of doing, uh, I think NASDAQ is a very, very big possibility. And I think, you know, I frankly think the New York Stock Exchange would have to think about how would it change its brand potentially and to, to move because it, maybe it would just be the stock exchange, you know what I mean, from from that point forward and then move in physical location. I don't think it's going to be called the Miami Stock Exchange, but, um, you know, it, and it, that anything is possible. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me, let's put it that way. And, 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 and I agree with Keith's horizon. Uh, you know, look, I, I, it's amazing what we've been able to accomplish in three months. I tell people... Listen, we live in a 24-hour news cycle where, uh, you know, it's it's hard to keep the attention of the world for one day. We have maintained the attention of the world for three months. Three months. Think about that. In, in, in a 24-hour news cycle, we've gotten, you know, we've been on every single television news station, every single major publication. The New York Times, for God's sake, which are, you know, they don't love to say great things about Miami. Two glowing articles about the city of Miami. So I, I think... Uh, what is happening? What happened is all these conditions allowed for this migration to happen. But then, the last piece was when people got here. This is to Keith's point. When people got here, they realized that it was real, right? They got here, and 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 as opposed to getting here, saying, "Well, this is a cool place, a nice place to party, uh, you know, a good place to hang out," they started having the same collisions in coffee shops that they had in Silicon Valley. I remember when I interviewed Keith for my Cafecito Tech Talk. He talked about that he had had more meaningful meetings in the short time that he had been here than in four years uh, in Silicon Valley before. So that kind of density and, and, and that kind of uh, uh, opportunity is what really is going to, is, is what's really changing the dynamic. And, and I'm telling you, I mean, I, I look, there was a couple of counter narrative articles in the last day of the, no, oh, the New Yorkers are going back to work. One of the ones cites a guy, this is hilarious. One of the ones cites a guy, the guy texted me, saying, I just put a contract on a $50 million house in Coconut Grove, okay? So the guy is definitely not even, you know? And so it's, 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 actually, it's actually kind of funny and it's, it's, it reeks a little bit of desperation that they're inventing stories of people going back when there are literally twice the number of flights from New York to Miami than from Miami to New York, like in terms of volume, right? There's twice the number of flights. Uh, so, you know, look, I, I, I think, this is a generational opportunity. We understand that. We are ready to capitalize on it. I'm gonna tweet till my fingers fall off. You know what I mean? If that's what it takes to make sure that this moment is captured in its full in uh, entirety, not just for my generation, for my son and my daughter. I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old, and for their unborn children. Because any, I don't care what anybody says. I, I, you know, th this this debate about. What you know, technology, Republican, Democrat, it's not a Republican Democrat issue. It is a fact. Technology dominates our economy. 
It dominates our life and it's only going to dominate it more in the future. There is no debate. There's nothing to disagree about. This is not even questionable. And cities have two choices. And I'm not just talking about cities in America. Cities in the world have two choices. You can grow your tech ecosystem and provide prosperity for your people, or you can ignore it or fight it or pretend that it's going to gentrify or whatever you know the, the negatives are on it. And, and, and your city will literally collapse and die. I mean, it sounds dramatic, but that's really what will happen. And, and just to uh, tee up one other re related question, I also keep hearing about you bringing in a sort of tech influence into government. So you just had this e-start initiative that just rolled out this, this, you know, I, I hear you talking about a virtual city hall. Tell us more about how you're bringing in that kind of tech, the actual technology, but also a tech mindset into government. Yeah, look, my predecessor was 30 years older than I am. You know, I was, I'm the first generation I was born with a personal computer, the first generation that has, you know, cell phones that are more powerful than, than the spaceships that, that took uh, astronauts into orbit, uh, you know? So for me, it's, it's, again, it's, it's, it's second nature to want to run a 4,500 employee billion dollar company with four labor unions in the most efficient technological way forward, understanding that Miami, what we are as a city, we're a service-based industry. We provide services. We pick up your garbage. We send. We go. We go and police your streets. We, we you know, we, 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 we send out firefighters when you have a, a health emergency. You know, we, we want to make building efficient. You know, what I mean, when Keith wants to start a, a business, we want to be him to be able to open the business quickly. We want him to be able to build out the building quickly. Right. That's facilitation. Right. That's service. And and service has to be, and what's great about technology is that it it allows for force multipliers and it allows for efficiency. So I have a gunfire detection system in my city. I know when every instantly when any any gunshot is fired within a five foot radius of, with a precision, I have I have cameras that pan to the location uh, automatically, dynamic cameras. I have a an artificial intelligence. Um, uh, camera system that, that has facial recognition so we can identify uh, perpetrators. Uh, I have, uh, like you said, uh, e-plans, um, e which was when I first got there, I created a way for all of our citizens to be able to, to uh, pull a permit and, and submit their plans electronically. That didn't happen before. Then I created e-start so that anyone that wants to start a business, and by the way, my, 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 my chief innovation officer hates the name, e-start, e -plan. he hates, he says, so like 1990s and i'm like listen buddy once we once we do egov then you can rename them whatever the hell you want i don't care but but so so e-star is is being able to start a business from your phone and from your your laptop and then i i i heard about something that orlando was doing and it prompted me to to do what i call egov or whatever you want to call it uh e city hall which is no no citizen in, in any city really but certainly in my city should ever have to walk into a government building period there is no reason, there's no need to walk into a government building. You should never, you should be able to interact with your government from where you are, Keith, from where you are, and from where I am, right from our the comfort of our own home. And and we're gonna do that. It's not that hard. It's it's and in fact the pandemic has made it easier because most people, you know, have been working from home anyways, and we haven't been working from a central location. So uh, it's already happening. Uh, but but yes, I, I do, I'm a big believer that uh, GovTech is a big industry. And it's something that, uh, as a as a service provider, um, we should be, uh, you know, intelligently spending money on technology that provides better services for our residents. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I, we're actually getting a, a few more questions coming in from the audience. Uh, a couple of them are for you, Keith. Uh, one is on uh, what, what's your advice to mid-level engineers or employees who might be worried about missing out on opportunities that they would have in say a San Francisco headquartered company. And then a related question saying, particularly if they're if they are minority, if they come from immigrant backgrounds, how, how can we make sure that they are integrated into the community of Miami as, as immigrant or minority talent? Well, on the first question, there's plenty of opportunities here. And if you're a talented engineer, I'm happy to hire you right away. So just send me your resume, keepthefoundersfund.com. We'll take care of that. Um, if not, you know, we'll, we'll redirect you to plenty of other opportunities here. But if you're an individual engineer, you have incredible number of opportunities all across the United States. So if you come to Miami, try it for a year, two years, three years, four years. If you love it, stay, build your own company here. That's an aspiration for lots of engineers to start their own company. And if you don't like it, 
plenty of people hire you all across America. So there's like zero risk for an individual like engineer who's talented. On the minority side, I mean, this is a much more diverse community than anything in the Bay Area. It's like 70% Hispanic. There's immigrants from all over the world. Um, I'm Jewish. There's Jewish people everywhere. Like I, I actually am still stuck on what synagogue to join because there's one on every block. Um, there's multiple kosher stores. The entire Bay Area has exactly one, maybe two kosher stores. So we can't even eat kosher in the Bay Area. So the diversity here is just like off, off the charts compared to the Bay Area. So I think that's like the worst excuse ever. And then the mayor, you know, correctly tweeted, um, there's more Hispanic and black engineers that are trained in Miami than any city in the United States. So there's a diverse set of, you know, a pool of incredibly talented people to hire from as well. Uh, Mayor Suarez, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that diversity point. I, I mean, I, I would just echo what, what Keith said. I mean, we have create, you know, what's been happening here in Miami is that we have, uh, before this moment, we were an intellectual talent exporter. So we created a significant amount of talent, right? People that were born and raised here that went to high school here, and then they left, right? And then because the jobs weren't here, they couldn't really come back. But this is the first time, let me tell you something that happened to me. It's happened to me a few times. Let me tell you a few stories. The first one is, it's the first time I've gotten a call from two Yale students, two, okay? That are not Miami kids. So it's not like a Miami kid that went to Yale, right? So a Miami kid that went to Yale, he wants to come back to Miami and get it. Two Yale students that told me we're graduating and we're going to Miami. So these are these are kids that are not from Miami, you know. So it, 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 the, the Miami story is resonating at the highest levels. It's 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 really uh, something that uh, I've never seen in, in, in my time. We we have been continually exporting talent uh, to the to the United States, and this is the first time that we that we're importing talent. The second story I'll tell you is, you know, we created this "How Can I Help" campaign, and we started selling T-shirts. And Keith's gonna get a kick out of the story. So I'm I was actually at a synagogue ironically, uh, at a shul in downtown. And I see a young man wearing the shirt with a, a blazer on top of the shirt. And they start questioning and answers. And I let him I let him ask the question because he's wearing a shirt. So I said, he's got to be able to ask a question. By the way, we have a really nice one for Keith with his name on it in the back and everything. It's a, a jersey style. So you're, you'll, you'll like it, Keith. And, 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 the, and the young man says, you know, look, I, I have never worn a t-shirt underneath a jacket. It's just not my style. He goes, but let me tell you what happened. I was wearing this T-shirt the other day, okay, in Miami, and someone stopped me and said, hey, do you have a tech company? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And he started telling about the company. The guy who stopped him because the T-shirt funded his company, okay, funded his company. So the guy said he bought 10 T-shirts because he wants to wear it every day. He said, I'm wearing the T-shirt every single day. This is, this is unbelievable. And then I have another friend, a good friend of mine, um, who is a councilman in another city, and he come, came up with a GovTech application so that um, it's basically a, a bar card that goes on the back of a, a business card so that uh, if, you know, if an employee gives you the card, you can rate the employee. Very simple concept, right? So he sends me a tweet. He sends, he tweets out at me. We adopted it in the city. He tweets out at me. I retweeted his tweet. Just my retweet, four VCs called him. Four VCs. So it, it, that never happened in Miami. That kind of density never was there. So that's what's changing the dynamic. Yeah. So for example, th uh, this week, just this week earlier, I think Monday morning, I was doing my normal fitness program, working out in this group fitness class. And um, after class, this guy comes up to me and says, hello, you know, introduces himself. And turns out he runs a hundred million dollar revenue company in Miami that nobody has yet funded. And I was like, oh my God, uh, where do I write the check? You know, <laughs> where do I wire this to? And by the way, this is great. So I can go to, I can justify going to more fitness classes all day now. <laughs> and by but the this way, is also, the, two, two, I'm just going to say two more stories. The guy who was buying the $50 million house in the article that's supposedly going back to New York, he, he has a $20 billion hedge fund. I've never heard of it. Nobody else has either. <laughs> and it's, he got $20 billion assets under management. Next to my house, three blocks away, and I don't live, I mean, I, I don't, my house is certainly not at the level of all these houses, but three blocks away, and, and four stories above my, my office, I'm a private lawyer as well. There's I squared, one of the, one of the principles of I squared, um, which is a $30 billion hedge fund. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know that he lived three blocks away from me. He's, you know, has a private 25, $30 million house on the water. And, and, and I didn't, I didn't even know him. So I, I mean, he's been in this community for three or four years. So it, it's, it's, it's also a community. What's also interesting about Miami that's changing is there's a lot of people that live kind of want to live under the radar. They just don't necessarily want to have such a high profile, but 
people like Keith and myself are making it okay for them to come out, right? Like this this particular gentleman uh, who works at A Squared was saying, look, I, I like to keep a low profile, but when, but I have two little kids. And when I saw what you were doing, I felt I felt an obligation to get involved. Like I, I said, I can't just be a passive participant in the city without actually taking an active role in this. And so that's, that, that narrative is also changing. I also think there's one other dimension that's pretty important here, which is related to that question asked by the engineer. People here are very welcoming to new people, um, and partially because a lot of people have moved to Florida from other places. Uh, Senator Rubio pointed out to me that he thinks that Florida has the only legislature in the country where a majority of the elected representatives in the legislature are actually not from Florida. And three of the last four governors here were not raised in Florida. So the community here is very approachable for new people, where that's not always true you know, in various places around the globe. Mm. Sure. That's that's a great point. I, I also hear people expressing worries, though, saying, you know, if you uh, are moving to Florida from California, are you going to bring California's problems to Florida? The one you hear all the time is high housing costs. And I know people in the chat here asking questions about high housing costs, too. Um, we've also talked about homelessness, crime, challenges like that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, how do you respond to that fear that you're just going to bring California's uh, problems? How do you ensure that housing remains affordable, for instance? Sure. sure. So let me take that question in two parts. One of them is because that question usually gets expressed in two different ways. The first is a political concern, like, oh, are people going to bring their politics over here? And what I often remind them is, well, when you came from when we came from Cuba, right? We did not want to import communism here. <laughs> you know what I mean? We 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 decided that this was the wrong ideology, and so we're fervently anti-communist. So what I've actually found is that people that have moved here, by and large, are fervently against the policies that they're moving away from. That they don't want to recreate those policies here. They realize it, that they don't that they they failed. And and remember, making a life decision like moving, it's a big decision. So you've got to get pushed pretty hard and pretty far to get to a point where you've decided you're going to pick up all your stuff and actually move to somewhere. That is a big decision. On on on, on um, affordable housing, I would actually say we're probably one of the best positioned cities in America to deal with that issue going forward. And let me explain to you why. With cities like New York and, 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 and San Francisco, we have artificially constrained their supply. So because you artificially constrain your supply, prices only have one direction to go. Kind of like Bitcoin, right? Uh, so it, it can only go one direction. Um, in, in the case, in the case of, of of us, we have the ability to grow in supply, right? In supply 10x. So the delta, the difference between what's built and what can be built, is a 10 to 1 differential. So just on the supply side, we have the ability to grow. That's number one. Number two, when you look at the cost differential, um, you know, a one bedroom in the urban core right now, unsubsidized, is sixteen hundred dollars. Okay, compare that to New York, compare that to San Francisco. You're talking about $3,500 in San Francisco, $3,500 in New York. So there's a cost of living differential that's already a two or three to one gap. Then we have the third thing is we've actually put out our residents have actually borrowed money. We borrowed $100 million under our Miami Forever plan to build affordable housing. So we've actually, as a community, said, hey, you know, we want to address this issue. Most cities in America haven't done that. And we're actually getting about a 20 to one leverage rate in the first $10 million that we uh, that we allocated. So we've gotten about $200 million worth of projects for $10 million, 722 units. If you multiply that out over hundred million, that's 7,200 units. That's uh, $2 billion for hundred million dollars of investment. If you, you know, we're, we're extending our CRAs, which could create another two or $300 million to, to play with. When you do the math, you're talking about 30,000 units, you know, and multiple billions of dollars of affordable housing. So we have, we have done all that. And, 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 in the private sector, we've allowed for micro units. We've allowed for we're allowing for co living units right now, which also keep uh, the price per unit down significantly. So we're doing private sector things. We're doing public private partnerships. We're working with our government partners. Uh, we're frankly the best positioned city, I think, in America, at least big city, uh, to 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 deal with affordable housing for the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Yeah, a couple of data a couple of data points there. Um, I tweeted this earlier this year that Miami currently has 21 skyscrapers under construction. I haven't counted in San Francisco, but I don't know that there is 21 skyscrapers total in San Francisco. Um, so in about half a residential. Second thing is the cost of building. Um, in San Francisco, I, re I read a pretty rigorously researched piece that the cost of building a single unit, lowest possible cost of building a single unit in San Francisco today is $800,000. That's the cost. 
So right now, I have friends buy very nice condos in Midtown, which is a very nice area of town, for 400K. So they're buying units at half the cost of construction in San Francisco. That's just a structural advantage that you cannot change fundamentally. Um, so I, th I, th I think that the affordability is very easy to solve. Um, and then given the land availability, I live in a very nice area of town. Within two tenths of a mile of my house, walking distance, there's five undeveloped plots of land right now available for sale. And this is something that uh, I, I could imagine uh, folks who say yes in my backyard in the Bay Area have been fighting for that, fighting, fighting uh, fights over laundromats that uh, people are trying to historically preserve. All of this sounds like a completely different world. It, it feels like living. It feels like living on a different planet <laughs> to a lot of people who live in the Bay Area. Too. Oh. That's why we're succeeding. so. Uh, yeah, so pivoting a little bit to education. I mean, I know that's also very important. One of the big topics right now is on reopening schools, keeping schools open. Um, what what does that look like in Miami? Have the schools stayed open, and how do you keep cultivating that talent, both K through twelve, but also above that too, to help keep this uh, boom going? So first of all, our school our schools have been open. We're probably the first state that opened schools, and I have to commend the governor for that decision. You know, he really followed the science on that. And there haven't been any major incidents, any major outbreaks uh, or any major uh, incidents from from them being open. On the contrary, um, I think, uh, you know, everybody else in the country has sort of realized, even you know, all the way up to the president, that keeping schools open is a, is a major priority, particularly for families who are struggling economically. Uh, it becomes even more important for them and for their children uh, to, to live as, as normal a life as possible. In terms of education, listen, this country certainly Miami, but this country needs to get the memo that technology is the future economy, period, right? So our curriculums from K through 12 need to reflect that. They don't right now, you know? And I think Miami, which won the Broad Prize for our public school system, the best public school system in the, in the nation a couple of years ago, we have the superintendent of the year, um, you know, New York tried to steal from us unsuccessfully. Uh, you know, we, 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 are doing a good job, but we have to do a better job. Because I think for us uh, to really distinguish ourselves, that last final piece is education. And it's K through 12. Uh, the Knight Foundation just invested $15 million in FIU and at University of Miami in um, their, uh, in terms of FIU and, and their uh, STEM building uh, and, and, and attracting the best teachers, the best professors from, from across the country. In the case of University of Miami and their analytics, data analytics uh, school. Uh, but but I think we have to we have to continue. There is a reputational differential. I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you that FIU and University of Miami has the same reputation as Stanford or Harvard or MIT. That would be ridiculous, right? Uh, I, I do think there's an opportunity to to bridge that gap quickly by creating partnerships with those organizations or by telling them to send their their students abroad, uh, which they're not really abroad, but abroad to Miami, right? And having them come uh, here and do internships at, at you know at, at companies founded by Keith and others. Uh, so I think there's ways to deal with it in the short run. I think in the long run, we just have to realize that, uh, you know, a premium education is the path to success in, in this country. And, and obviously, um, you know, we have to continue to invest in upskilling. And then the last piece is we cannot forget about the grandchildren, the grandparents in our community for which a lot of technology, um, it, it, you know, they don't really understand how, how it helps them, right? And I would say it helps them in two ways. The first is their grandchildren and children stay as opposed to leaving and not coming back. And then the second part is we're working with a company, I'm not sure if it's on Keith's radars yet, uh, called Papa. Um, but Papa is an amazing company. Uh, it's going to be a Miami unicorn. And, and, and what they do is they provide companionship, particularly during a pandemic, for the elderly at no cost to the elderly through the health plans. I mean, it's incredible. I think they have 30,000 members right now. They're going to have 30 million uh, in, in a few years. Uh, but, but, but you have to create technologies that actually help the quality of life of, of the elderly in our community. They're already doing it with Facebook. There's a lot, a lot of elderly on uh, social media, um, but you got to keep doing it with other innovative uh, products. Keith, I wonder if you have uh, thoughts too on the talent question. I know that's important for, for you. Yeah. I mean, I think the mayor's point is you know, dead on, which is um, Miami has been exporting talent to the rest of the the world really for a long time, particularly in the technology sector. You know, Jeff Bezos from here, Shell Sandberg from here, Lee Fixel, who does what I do, is from here. Lots of 
it's actually several of my CDOs currently in the portfolio are from here. Some I knew about that were from here, some I actually discovered later. And many of them, if not most of them, actually would prefer to move back. They still have family relations here. They had great experiences growing up here. And so just if you did nothing else except, you know, have the talent return, that alone would create plenty of talent for a long time here. Then you have the ability to import talent. And I think as we have more aspirational opportunities, people who graduate from, let's say, the University of Chicago, Champaign, Illinois, which is as good as CS degree as you can get anywhere on the globe, or CMU um, will come here, MIT come here. Um, it'll take time to build um, educational institutions. Or you don't turn brands and education overnight into MIT, Stanford, Harvard, et cetera, but you don't need to either. You can just constantly improve every year, and then that compounds you know, 10 years later, and it is a first-rate institution. Um, there's, like, for example, there's a university in Massachusetts that's done a phenomenal job in really resurrecting, improving their brand. I think there's some opportunities to create remote campuses for highly successful engineering-based uh, schools, think like in the Midwest, et cetera. You know, Stanford even had to put a campus in New York um, for a variety reasons. So I, I think there's lots of opportunities to sort of take shortcuts, but I think bottom up building is the best way to do it for a long term sustainable ecosystem. But we don't really need to we just need to have people who were born and raised here who have incredible talent to want to return because they feel there's opportunities that all I hear from them all day long is how fast can I come back? And, and, and Mayor Suarez, we, we also can't forget immigration, which has been absolutely central to the story, to your story, to Miami's story. How have COVID travel restrictions, decline in international travel affected the city and immigration in the short run and, and kind of in the long run, how central is immigration to Miami's future? I, I personally think it's a very, it's very central. It's really a part of all of our stories. I mean, at some point or another, one of our predecessors uh, em immigrated to this country, right? This is a country uh, that was created by immigration. Uh, so uh, for me, um, it, it's an issue where particularly pre-pandemic where we're at full employment you know we, we need to start thinking about the conversation a little differently we got to start thinking about it as there we're having a hard time hiring people you know oftentimes we're having a hard time finding people that want to do certain jobs so we need more help we need more uh people that want to do it and what's beautiful is the the upward mobility in this country if you if you want to study if you want to learn you can get upskilled you can you can uh you know you can have upward mobility in this country. It's one of the few countries in America that allows the um, the maitre d at a hotel to be the hotel manager, uh, the the you know the the doorman in a in a hotel to become the general manager of the hotel, um, and so and it happens all the time. So it, you know that's the beauty of this country, and I think Miami was built on immigration. I mean it's it, and 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 I think that's part of our success uh, to to keep point about our diversity. You know, people feel comfortable when they're here. We want them to feel comfortable. We want them to feel welcome. It's got like a big city, small city feel, right? Like it's a, we're, we're, we're kind of a big city, but we have a small city feel. We all know each other. We take care of each other. We look out for each other. Um, we protect each other. And, and Mayor, as far as, I mean, your, your father emigrated to the U.S. from Cuba when he was young, went on to study law at Harvard, if, if, if I remember correctly, and then became yeah. mayor of Miami himself. I mean, that, that seems like a great example of that American dream. I mean, yeah. as you reflect on that, how, how did America's culture and policy help make that possible? How, how has that ex shaped your own understanding of what the American dream is? It's been incredibly uh, influential. I mean, it's my mom came when she was six. My dad came when he was twelve. If we didn't have that opportunity to come legally to this country, I wouldn't have. We wouldn't have. I, who knows what I would be doing right now? God knows. Uh, but my dad's story is an amazing story. It's he's a ninth of fourteen children. You know, I mean, my my grandfather was an academician. He was the dean of the engineering college in Vienna University in Cuba. It's one of the smartest people that I know. My dad is a genius. I mean, like literally a genius. He he. Um, you know, learned the language at 12, took the SAT at 17, or started learning the language at 12, came to this country at 12, learned the language by the time he was 17, took the SAT, got almost a perfect score, got a presidential scholarship, which they gave out one a year at Villanova University for mechanical engineering, where he graduated summa cum laude in mechanical engineering. That is not easy to do, folks, okay, <laughs> for the mechanical engineers in the room. They're, they know what I'm talking about. There are professors that are still alive at Villanova that think he was the smartest student that ever went there. Okay, and then his encore to being uh, summa cum laude was to get two graduate degrees from Harvard, a master's in public policy, 
and and his law degree, uh, you know, his master of public policy from the Kennedy School. At the time, the Kennedy School was the only school in the world that had the master's of public policy. It was, it was a quantitative approach to to public administration. Uh, and and he's written, I think, eight books or nine books uh, in his life. Uh, speaks four or five languages. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, if I had half the intelligence that he has, I probably could run for president of the United States. <laughs> and, and you are yourself a mayor of Miami. That is nothing to, to laugh at. That is, that is an impressive achievement. And you are now here at a house of time in Miami. It's a terrific story. Um, and, uh, Keith, I, I do want to jump in and point to you as well. I mean, you also have an incredible story and the companies you've been founding have also been part of America's success over the past handful of years. I mean, how, how do you hope that your story will play into Miami's future and its success? Well, I think there's several buzzes. I think setting an example, obviously, you know, encouraging people to, you know, <laughs> escape jail basically and vote with their feet. Um, and that helps everybody because it helps build high paying, prospectively interesting jobs here, but it helps polit politicians um, sort of have to correct their, you know, sort of insane dysfunctional policies because they're going to lose all of their voters. They're going to lose all, I mean, California, the last census lost a congressional seat, I think for the first time ever, certainly the first time in a century, it's going to absolutely lose more congressional seats in the next census, unless there's a radical change, like the governor is recalled, which probably will happen actually. Um, but in any event, so I think setting an aspirational example for people relocating to places that are more friendly, more aspirational, where people emulate success as opposed to penalize success, and then encourage people to fix their policies where they're broken. Second, create jobs, like literally directly create jobs. So we're hiring in Miami. We have an office, uh, uh, you know, lease in Miami. Uh, we're scaling from like six to eight people to 20 people very quickly. Um, we'll be hiring more, you know, if you get early signals from the market that what we're doing is working. And then um, encouraging other people to move here and create more jobs. So, you know, PayPal wasn't just a success for individual employees. It wasn't a success for our investors. What PayPal really did was empower anybody to become an entrepreneur, anybody to become an entrepreneur on the web or in the real world. Before PayPal, the process of getting, accepting payments was basically the province of elite gatekeepers. And you had to apply. You literally had to apply and it take weeks and months. And you had to have fit all these criteria, including like social security numbers and like credit checks. And we basically said, wow, you're never going to create a business successfully in the United States if you can't accept credit, Visa, MasterCard, you know, Amex, et cetera. And we're going to make this everybody eligible to become an entrepreneur. And that's what actually fueled a lot of people creating their own businesses successfully. And then we did that in some ways, the same, same playbook, but more offline than online for Square. So empowering people and kind of the old Jack Kempian like language was basically that's what we did is we basically empowered people with tools to build their own businesses for their future. And so that's what we aspire to do with all of our companies. That's incredible. And, and Mayor Suarez, final thoughts. This event is called The Case for Miami. You walk into an elevator and you have to make that elevator pitch for Miami. What is it? Give it to us. Well, it's very simple that we're going to continue to do the simple things to make us successful, the most successful city in the world. We're going to keep our taxes low. We're going to increase uh, our police so that we have uh, the safest big city in America. Uh, we're going to get to functional zero on homelessness uh, and we're going to we're going to invest in quality of life. So the better question for you is not uh, whether you should move to Miami. The better question is, why haven't you already moved to Miami? <laughs> and with that. Thank you both, uh, Mayor Suarez, Keith. Thank you for joining us today. This has been a terrific discussion. Uh, to all of those watching, this has been a Young Leaders Circle event with the Manhattan Institute. Uh, while well, Sierra's our program for young professionals, we welcome you to join and follow. And thank you for tuning in. If you like what you saw, subscribe, support us, follow us online. We're even on Clubhouse now. Uh, thank you again for tuning in and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.